Welcome folks. It's a beautiful afternoon here in the Adirondacks. We're going to be starting our lunchtime live program shortly. Hello. Cora or Raven is saying hello to everybody. Hello. 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 Oh, you're not going to say hello now that people are watching? Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lunchtime Live. My name is Leah. I'm the curator here at the Wild Center. Um, and this afternoon, it is beautiful here in the Adirondacks. It is, uh, I can tell you, we can go look at, let's go look at our thermometer that we have outside. It is 51.7 degrees, which is a much welcome change for us. It is still very snowy here in the Adirondacks. We still have snow covered trails. I'll just flip you around so you can see. That's the trails behind me in our pond. So still snowy, but beautiful. And this afternoon, I thought we would check in with our albino porcupine, who still has yet to be named. Stay tuned. We're, 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 working, on a, we're working on something that hopefully we can involve all of you in helping us give this little porcupine a name. So we're out in the sunshine, or actually we're in the shadow right now. I thought we would come out, we'd let her get a little um, fresh air, and she's having her lunch. Yeah, Amber says it's definitely gorgeous near Plattsburgh, I'm sure. I'm, I'm so glad. It's nice to be outside making vitamin D. Um, but porcupines are one of my favorite Adirondack animals. They are super interesting, and you know, the one thing people always think of when I think of porcupines is, of course, their quills. They have about 30,000 quills on their body. Now, it's a little hard to see on this girl right here because she's actually also got a lot of fur. So let's see if you can get a little closer. You can kind of see her fuzzy fur. Underneath that is hiding all of her quills. And then she's also got these kind of really long wispy things. Those are not quills that my finger is touching right now. Those are a special type of guard hair. They're basically whiskers that help them feel their environment. They actually don't have the best eyesight. So all those kind of really long wispy things that are the longest part, those are guard hairs. Now, you're gonna notice that this little girl looks different than your average porcupine. As a matter of fact, let's go look at a regular porcupine. While we're standing here, this is Stickly. Our other porcupine, she looks like a typical porcupine, dark brown. Um, you can see some of her quills, the white you're kind of seeing on her. Um, those are her quills sticking through her fur and the brown is the fur. Now let's come back and look at this lady. Clearly, she looks different. So she is all white and her eyes are reddish pink. Who knows what that means? Anybody wanna guess? What does that mean for her? She is actually an albino porcupine, which is pretty rare. And what that means is she doesn't make pigment like a regular porcupine would. So none of her fur is colored. None of her quills are colored. Her eyes are that reddish color because she doesn't have colored irises like normal. Um, so this is a pretty rare occurrence. This is, she's actually the first albino porcupine that I've ever seen. Um, and I've seen quite a few in all the years that I lived, lived here. Um, and she came to us late in the fall. She actually was live trapped as a nuisance animal. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little more, how porcupines are sort of seen by some folks um, as nuisance animals. She was live trapped. She came to us so we could check her out. And what we found upon examination was that she had a pretty serious injury to one of her hind legs. And it was so serious that we felt like we couldn't um, take care of it ourselves. So we took her down to a very special wildlife clinic that is run by Cornell University, their veterinary school, and they are experts. So they checked her out and determined that yes, that leg was severely injured and they actually ended up amputating it. So for that reason, um, she wouldn't do very well in the wild on her own because even though she has all those quills, there are predators that would be interested in her to make a meal out of her. And being white like this, she would certainly stand out. And missing one leg, she would be at a disadvantage. So it would be harder for her to 
you know, maybe climb trees and get the food she wants and also avoid predators. And if you guys have questions, I'll do my best. I'm trying to watch the comments as they go by. If you have questions, feel free to drop them below in the comments. Let's take a look at what this lady is eating right now. So she has these kind of tan things. These are called rodent pellets. If you've ever had a guinea pig or a pet rat or any kind of rodent, usually this comes in your food with seed. It's just a commercial diet. It's fairly hard. It has all the right vitamins, minerals, calories, all that kind of stuff for them. Helps keep their teeth in check because as a rodent, um, their teeth continually grow. She's also got some fruits and veggies in here. Today she has, ooh, she's got some strawberry, some sweet potato, some carrot, some cauliflower, a berry, but she's mostly going after those rodent pellets. That seems to be what her favorite is right now. In the wild, they eat a lot of plants. They're eating plants. So they're, they're not going after other animals and they're gonna eat a lot of tree products. So this time of year, um, as we're coming out of winter, they, they're mostly eating bark and pine needles in the winter. As it starts to warm up and things start to bud out, they'll start eating sort of the tender shoots on trees and some other plants, bushes. And then as we move into the summer, um, they'll add flowers and fruit and other things to their diet. So, and that is one of the reasons why they often become sort of an issue when they're interacting with humans because she was actually trapped um, on an apple orchard. I'm sure she was having a great time eating the apple trees but I'm also sure that the apple farmer wasn't too excited about that. <laughs> so that is one of the ways that sometimes they interact with humans and they get into trouble. One of the other ways we find that they get themselves into trouble is they really like to find sources of salt. And in nature, there's not a lot of sources, easily available sources of salt to get. So just like we need salt to be healthy, they do too, and they'll look for sources. And a lot of those sources end up being human things. A lot of the lumber we use to build um, our houses and our camps and our, all of our buildings um, is pressure treated lumber that has a high salt content. Uh, believe it or not, if you've been using tools like an ax and you were sweaty, that sweat will leave salt and she'll go after that. And sometimes they'll even go after like the underneath of cars because as we pick up salt in the winter, it gets all underneath our cars. I see Jessica asks, how old is she? She was um, born last summer at some point. We don't ex know exactly when, so she's not quite a year old yet. So yeah, sometimes they can be a nuisance. However, they're really adorable. I might be biased. I think they're really adorable. She's got a little dirt on her nose. I just wanna wipe it off, but I won't do that. Now, a lot of people often ask, can we pet them? I mean, you could, we don't. I could, you know, sort of run my hand this way down her fur and her quills and it would be okay. When they feel threatened, they, they can actually raise those quills up. It's kind of like when we get goosebumps and our hair stands up, a very similar thing happens. All their quills will stand up. They will turn their back towards whatever is threatening them, they'll kind of tuck in a ball and then they'll sway their tail back and forth. And then if anybody's ever had a dog that's gotten quilled, what usually happens is the dog gets close enough, they get smacked by that tail and that's how they end up with a ton of quills. So, but I could pet her right now. I don't, I don't because I don't think she would enjoy that. Um, and it wouldn't hurt, but I don't think she would enjoy it. So I typically don't. Do they throw quills, Jessica wants to No, That's a great question, Jessica. And it is something that lots of people have heard. It is actually not true. So they do have a muscle that controls each quill and what they can do with it is raise it, like I mentioned, when they feel threatened. Um, and when it's raised, it's a little looser in the follicle. So anything that comes into contact, anything that touches it will stick. But they can't shoot them with any force. They, they can't do that. Sometimes when they shake and they'll shake like a dog, quills will fall off and it almost looks like they're shooting them but they can't. I certainly probably wouldn't stand this oops wouldn't stand this close to her if that were the case.
will we be keeping her forever? Tim wants to know. Um, yes, Tim, we actually, you know, once we heard that she needed her leg amputated, um, we uh, decided that we would offer her a job here at the Wild Center. Um, but we knew that she had a long road of recovery ahead of her. She was very sick. Her injured leg had been very infected. So it took her a little while to get healthy enough. Um, and then she came back here. We offered her a job. She accepted. So far, she seems to be liking it. Jessica wants to know if they're nocturnal. Yes. So the majority of the time they're um, out and about moving around at night and spending a lot of their day sleeping which is what she was doing before I woke her up to bring her out for this program. Now we generally only, you know, take her out a couple times a week or any of our animals. So we try not to interrupt their regular schedule too much. And she also doesn't seem to mind. Right now she's munching on some sweet potato. It's one of her favorites. She loves sweet potato. And this is, I think the second time we've brought her out for a program. In the winter, they tend to, when it's really cold, they'll slow way down. They spend a lot of their time in trees, but sometimes in the winter, they'll go down to ground. They'll find some kind of um, shelter, which could be underneath a big fallen tree. It could be a little cave or something like that. And they'll just sit there for several days. So our porcupines tend to slow way down in the winter. So we, we didn't really handle her that much. And now that it's nice out, we're bringing her out. So this is really the first, first time that she's been out here um, and come out of her crate willingly. So we try to take it slow for each animal and let them tell us what they're comfortable with. We are open to the public today um, and you might hear visitors come up and ask me questions while I'm standing here because I'm also, I'm on the other side of what we call our animal viewing window. So visitors can come up here, they can see our porcupines, I'll turn around, they'll show you. That's where Stickly lives. Here's our Eastern Screech Owl Luna. Over here is our Raven Cora, who was saying hello to me just when I started. And then behind her, it's kind of really hard to see. Way in the back, right there, is our Peregrine Falcon, Artemis. And here's our as yet named Porcupine. And I love that people are suggesting names. Um, after a while, when you've named a lot of animals, you sort of run out of creative energy for naming. So we're hopefully gonna crowdsource a name very soon. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. She did drive a hard deal, Tim. She asked for at least three days a week off and um, corn on the cob as often as possible when it's in season. <laughs> Yes, Jerry, she is an albino porcupine. And this is, I was saying earlier, this is the first albino porcupine I've ever encountered. She is with us because um, she had a very severe injury to one of her legs and um, it had to be amputated. So she's, she's missing one of her hind legs. Bessie would be a great name. Thanks for the suggestion, Jessica. We've had some sort of fun thinking about names. One of my coworkers keeps suggesting Eileen because she's missing a leg. Get it, Eileen? <laughs> I don't think that will end up being her name, but um, who knows? Irv suggests the name Ivory. I like it, Irv. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all can hear our Raven is making a lot of vocalizations next to me. Does she talk as I've heard others, especially when eating? Um, I'll bring you close. You can hear her munching, but she doesn't mumble when she eats. She's actually fairly quiet for the most part. Our other porcupine stickly does a lot more vocalizing. Name suggestion from Sarah is Nimbus. Ooh, I like that. Sort of Harry Potter. I like that name. So uh, when we first got her, um, she was very sick. You know, she had that injured leg. She had a pretty bad infection. She was very thin. Um, and she was very afraid of us, but we work really hard on getting all of our animal ambassadors used to being around our staff first and then getting used to being around crowds and people. And you can see I am, I'm literally right, right here next to her and she 
pretty much is tolerating my presence, which is good. We don't want her to be stressed. Just taking a little step back. Okay, need a break from lunch. Break it. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Hopefully you'll come see us in the future in person. Um, we will be closed the whole month of April, but after that we will be open and you can come visit us. We'll have lots of cool things for you to see and do here at the Wild Center. So stay tuned. Thanks again for joining us and we will see you next time.